So normally when you're watching my videos, this is the production table. And my workroom is also my TV room, which surprisingly is a little bit cleaner than it usually is, and that's because I've moved everything onto the couch. Well, this room here, when I first began to remodel it back in 2013, was pretty purpose-built for the task. There's this nice custom shelving here which sits on top of these map drawers and a pair of speakers on either side square it out. But it's also a little bit cluttered in here as well. Now some of this is just projects I've been holding off on while I've been trying to do other things and other is just genuine clutter which I need to clean out. This room is scheduled to be cleaned up a fair bit here, probably if not this year, next year. But there's another room which hasn't seen any serious remodeling for 10 years as well. And that's going to be down this hallway here. For you see, this is not a static set. This is a main hallway. I have books here. I have disc packs. And then it's my bedroom. Which is itself a rather miserable, boring looking place. Really what happened when I first moved into this room was that I painted the walls cleaned the floor, uh, moved in my desk and some leftover shelving, as well as my bed, and it's been like that ever since. Now, over time, there is a bookshelf here, and I used to have a TV sitting up here, but that TV broke years ago, and it just kind of filled up with crap. And over time as well, as I've been holding off YouTube projects, this is also filled up with crap at the foot of my bed as well. And I mean, look at this, like there's synthesizers over there, uh, there's a Xerox memory writer down there. Tech Tangents knows this one quite well. The wheel writer's in that box there. Hiding right there is a Sony front projection uh, TV. Um, there's the screen for it all behind here. I don't even know why I still have that. I gotta get rid of that. Uh, Apricot Systems. There is a Sony Japanese system there as well as some fax machines, Lisa, whatever, more documentation, laser disc player, more boxes, terminals, high-speed cameras. This room needs to be badly reorganized. And that is my plan, is that I will be reorganizing this room in fairly short order. And I have a plan for it. Let's go take a look at it. Now, as you can see, it is quite dusty. And the reason it's so dusty is that planning for this started in Late 2020, remember when everybody during COVID began renovating? And as a result, like, the demand for lumber went through the roof? Well, that was started, the planning was mostly done, and then because of the cost of lumber, that was just abandoned. But now that it's come drastically down in price, I'm able to start working on this again. So here is a mock-up of my bedroom, and it is to scale. Uh, the main issue is that in that far corner there, I do have the main water shut off for the house that needs to be made more acceptable or more accessible because right now my bed is in the way so the idea is that we have a window here the bed's going to go there we have shelving that we're going to add to the end here the tv will mount there we have shelving that we're going to add here which is going to replace the shelving that was underneath the tv and i can then put my desk there and I can choose where on earth I want to put my teletype machine. And unfortunately, that wardrobe is going to be stuck where it is because that there is no closet in that room. So either it sits there, it sits there. We continue to move it around. Yes, these are all to, all to scale. I like having little tiles when I organize things. Those keyboards and synthesizers I may put onto a table here. And I might have shelving that goes around the top edge here. I also want to deal with the lighting in that room. When I originally moved back into this room, it was a single light on the ceiling, and it was this 100-year-old um, incandescent lamp socket. And then what's happened over the years is I got an adapter, which lets me run to a fluorescent ballast. And there's a fluorescent tube, which runs the length of the room, and that is the lighting for the room. There is acoustic foam all over the ceiling because, well, there really is no noise insulation on this side of the house. On the other side, in the bedroom on the other end there, it is actually insulated in the ceiling. Here, however, it is not insulated, so I had to figure out a solution. This is also the reason why I want to have my bed immediately in front of the window. 
this is not fireproof rated or fire rated at all. If this for some reason goes up, I need to get out of this room very fast. So in front of the window we go. But we may reorganize this foam. Unfortunately, uh, it, it, it can't go away. It's just you get too much floor noise from above. So um, we will be redoing the lights. I have an idea for this, but we're going to be getting rid of this rather jank and frankly, very scary wiring. Now, with this corrugated foam, I am going to take this portion of the video to say, do as I say, not as I do. The reason why acoustic foam paneling is so expensive is that it contains a special blend of, well, foam, acoustical dampening properties, and it has fire retarding properties. This does not. And will happily burn if given the opportunity. That's also the reason why I'm mounting it on the ceiling and not the walls. Because if by the time the ceiling catches on fire, well, the room's already gonna be a total loss. So I asked of everyone watching this video, do not, under any circumstances, use non-acoustic corrugated foam for sound dampening. I'm using it because I am absolutely stupid. End of discussion. And speaking of wiring, you may have already noticed this scattered around already. There's parts of the prepay meter scattered around here looking like they are being painted and cleaned. That is absolutely the case. This room is going to be switched over to prepayment electricity because it has one 15 amp breaker and everything, get ready for low frame rate mode, there we go, everything comes in through this outlet here. So I've currently temporarily removed the big switch. We remember the big, big switch, I did a video on that a number of years ago. So I'm going to have an extender that comes out. I will have to redo the bezel for the big switch because the big switch will be going back there. And as you can see, I have armored cables here, or cables here. And those have been all painted. They'll be going up to this box here, and I put a backing board here, and the prepay meter, meter is going to go there. Hiding up in the corner here is actually where the uh, networking and AM, FM radio antenna, and even twin axe for some reason goes into the room. That might change. That might also just remain there. But this cable here is going to have to go. And to heavily contrast that room, I've also repainted the prepayment meter back to uh, its glossy black like it originally was from the blue it was on there. That was a day and a half of just stripping all that blue paint off of it. But most of it was also flaking off as well. So we'll redo that. Yes, I did take the badge off. I was able to clean it because the other one was kind of rough. So... The other issue we're going to have to deal with is I have an electrical outlet here and an electrical outlet here, plus a phone line. Uh, what I will be doing is I'm going to be using um, out-of-wall Panduit Raceway, nice metal stuff, to relocate this outlet over here if I can, and over here to relocate this outlet to either here or here. Presumably I'm going to put it here. The telephone is going to remain there, but what I might do is just add additional wiring because I want to add an extra circuit here to have the telephone either on this side or that side. And on this wall right here, I want to mount a fax machine because I'm insane. This is probably the closest we're ever going to get to a wall mountable fax machine. This is the Panasonic KX F80. It has a built-in speaker phone. It has no handset on it. Uh, the paper actually, when you do your scanning, feeds in through here, pops out through the base, also prints out through the base, micro cassette answering machine. So you just need to make a bracket and this only sits about two, two and a half inches off of the wall. There's nothing on the back that would get in the way. There's nothing here that would actually fall off if it's mounted on the wall. So this is gonna be mounted on the wall. And it's going to feed back in to our friend, the KX-TD816 in there, which is the PBX that runs the whole house. So it'll run as a phone. Sure, it can ring, but it can also now receive faxes specifically. Uh, another thing I might mount onto the wall there is one of these. Panasonic made a couple of these neat wall-mountable um, 
micro stereo systems. Um, if you want to have a CD player, there you go, it has a CD player in it. Uh, if you want to have yourself a spot for an iPod, yeah, that's for sure. You can put an iPod in there, it'll charge it, you can control it over there. You have speakers built in, as well as you have antenna inputs and controls, so I can use the antenna that's on the roof of the house. And I still have space for my alarm clock, even. Lastly, the door. So this door here is actually mounted upside down. By sheer miracle does the actual handle fit. But there's a giant gap on the top there because that's the door to this room right there. This used to be my sister's bedroom. And then I just kind of moved in when I moved back from Vancouver. But the way this is is that it allows a little bit of ventilation, which is fine. But in a fire situation, not ideal. Um, we'll try and rectify the door. Also, if we saw the floor plan here, we have to now have the door go 180 degrees since the desk and the O2 and all that's going out of the way. My idea, however, since about where I'm standing with this battery pack here, otherwise known as a doorstop, um, is also where the corner of the set of shelving at the end of my bed is going to be. So I say we have an extra length of wood about the width of my feet here, so that way, the door can be closed for full privacy. The door can be opened to there, to 90 degrees. And then it'll actually catch on a latch so it can hold it right there. That then allows for ventilation through the room. Window can be open. You have the space above here because there's a low spot from the plenum there. But I still have blocked access to my room and my little desk area. And then lastly, you can just turn it again and you can swing it all the way against that wall there and now it's completely open. Um, this also may not happen simply because, <laughs> well, um, we may have space issues to deal with. Also, it may just be way too cumbersome. And also, we have to remember, there are some things in this room which barely fit through this door as it is. If we begin to add this like very tight 90 degree turn, is thing are things going to be built into the room? We don't want that. But now that we have a plan in motion here, I'm finally able to start packing th stuff up and getting things out of here. That is specifically the reason why there is going to be no videos produced in January. I need all the space here, which my cameras and my bench are usually occupying, to store the contents of that room. As things are handled and processed, separated, recycled, and then returned back to the room, I'll get access to this room back again. So, again, I apologize if you get no content during January, at the very least. This is why. Did you really think I wasn't going to put that back on there? This is the greatest thing ever. Thank you, Australia.
Let's see how long it takes for me to get annoyed by that. <sighs> well, that was short-lived, and I haven't done any woodwork yet here. All right, well, the meter's installed, the wiring was done, but we're not actually done with the wiring. So, as it turns out, I let this run out, and the light's turned off. Uh, the power for the outlet that's here, I thought it was down here, it's actually over there, has, um, that has, that went off, sorry. So, obviously the extension cord that's running across there to that alarm clock went off, whatever. This did not. And as we can see here, as I try not to electrocute myself, there is a lot going on on this thing. And that is because what is going on is that this is a whole other circuit. Comes down into here, you uses those back ports that stab in there, not really the best, and the screw terminals and the other stab ports here, uh, then go to the outlet on the other side of this wall, an outlet in the far corner of the house on the inside in that room, another outlet in that other room, the light in that room, my bathroom, the light, the fan, the outlet, and the light in the hallway outside. Doesn't do the room over here, doesn't do the outlet in the hallway either. And we know that we have one extra set of wires that are here, which again, doesn't serve that room or anything in there. So there's a mystery now of where the hell that goes. Cool. All right, I think the plan here, since that is no good, is we will delete this entirely. I'm just gonna turn this into a junction box with a cover plate on it. And because I used a Panduit box here, I'll run a metal raceway down and across, and I'll put a new outlet right next to it. And then that'll solve our electrical problem for that. Well, three days later, that's most of the room is now cleaned out. Or I should be honest here, most of the stuff I can get out of the room has been cleaned out. My plan here, as you can see my bed frame and a couple other odds and ends are gonna stay in here. And with the four cleared like this, Now's a good time to give it a much needed wash and clean. So it's gonna get shampooed. And then I gotta deal with some of the nonsense which was the dirt and filth that just naturally builds up on some of the walls here. So I'm just gonna go down with it with a wet rag. And I decided to pull the carpeting away a little bit here and that all but confirms that corner at one time used to be a closet. So that was a closet delete and then that's why our main water meter is in here. And that's also one of the reasons why I did the renos is because you couldn't access this. But these walls here, I tell you, even if the camera doesn't want to focus on them too well because they're so white, like I was just kind of cleaning it and it just popped off here. So I can see like behind here is a cement wall, insulation, plastic vapor barrier, and then the fake wood paneling. And if I use a screwdriver to probe in that corner there, this actually goes back a good six to eight inches before it actually hits the wall. So there's a huge cavity that's hiding behind here. And for many, many years, for the entire time I've lived here, uh, we've had mice. And it's, this room is especially bad. I'm so tempted to just pull some of this away to see what's behind it. But at the same time, I don't want to because then I'd have to re-nail this in and paint it and it's just not going to be fun. But you have nonsense like this which may not, yeah it does kind of show up. You see this single yellow line here? Goes from up there all the way to the floor. Yeah that's mouse piss. So like the mice have been getting in there. There's a giant space up there. There's a giant cavity in the ceiling. Like it's, a te it's essentially a giant mouse hotel that's living up there that we've been fighting to get rid of for decades. And this is all gross, I gotta clean this up. So this is one of the reasons also I wanna go in here is to wash the walls and try and get as much of this mouse nonsense out of here, just in case it is kind of my problem. And of course, I'm getting to notice other weird little things here when I look into the cavity. So when we had the water meter installed, because that's a new thing, they um, had to cut some of the wall boarding. So, that just wobbles freely. Hello, there's a nail up there wobbling somewhere as well, but it means that that entire support there, I can't load anything onto that because it would just be the wall that supports it. Why is this? Okay, um, that's not supposed to come off. I'll have to report that to the city. 
Anyways, all right, so I'm gonna put a screw in here so at least this stops wobbling on us and we'll go from there. Are you tired of shampooing and cleaning your floors? Cry about it, roll over, cry some more. Introducing the Bissell Magic Steamer Plus. And I'm gonna have to do this all again once this dries. I move all this crap to the other side of the room, and I gotta vacuum and clean it again. All right, with the power off again, I'm now finally able to run the initial bits of the raceway here, which is going around to the other corner of the room. This is gonna be a fun experience because the boxes that we have here are sort of correct. The actual like pass-through boxes aren't available from the Home Depot, only this style here. But they do have knockouts on the back side, so we're just routing the wires through there. And then we have our raceway, we have that corner elbow, which is the wrong shade of white. We're going to have to paint that white. This was all scratch and dent panduit, hence we have this horrible scratch there that I'm going to have to repaint, as well as those screws. And then there's our final termination on this side of the room, is that side of the box there. Now we are using that box correctly. Now running the raceway along here also has a double effect, because you see that? No, this isn't bent, this is straight, the wall is not straight. And you see how I pulled it away here before and I've now nailed it down? The reason I had that happen at all is because um, the wall breathes. So even where I'm pushing right now, it's banging up against the, uh, the wall joists right there, or wall framing. So I'm just going to put a white nail in there and that will shut that right up. And then down here, because this is going across, this is also going to help to prevent it from moving around when it's windy outside. Yes, I'm surprised the house is just that drafty. So since these new raceway outlets uh, come with brand new receptacles in them, I'm looking at the old ones here and we're going to be replacing these because we have the ability to do so. However, the ones that come in these packages, throw them away. I don't trust them. No, seriously. Um, I don't necessarily like these style of receptacles. First off, I don't know who makes this. It's not Leviton. It's not General Electric. I don't like it, first off, because I don't know who makes it. The second is that these are plastic welded together. Even the original ones here, they have rivets on the back here. The whole face of this thing is riveted together. Even with Leviton ones, and I've got to bring them up, is that I've had problems with brand new ones where the plastic welds fail, and because this screw here is actually attached to the plastic, the whole face of the outlet falls off, and then it's just an exposed outlet. I don't like these. So, I would rather go out and buy, sure, it's Leviton, but it's the more heavy-duty receptacles. These ones, at the very least, have a rivet that travels straight through and keeps the face on. They aren't just plastic welded. In fact, these are clipped together as well. So they're much stronger, they're much more durable. Note, however, they do not have shutters as well. I understand that the safety shutters are a new thing that are being required in all new installations. I've had problems with those outlets. And to put into context the premium that is to get these instead of the nice safety shutter ones, safety shutter receptacles, I'm just going to use this piece of junk again here, this would be $1.50 to $2 at the Home Depot. To buy just one of these, is four dollars and fifty cents after taxes you're looking at five dollars so four outlets in the room to do that's twenty dollars just in receptacles but i have a lot more faith in these 70 year old electrician's tools perfect every time so as i finish off and put the face plates on i realize hold on a second i'm missing a screw here so remember this is the ivory, well not ivory, but the plain white faceplate that comes with it. Even in the packaging here, you can see there's no center screw there for the receptacle. Okay, well, there is a little hardware baggie that comes inside of each of these packets. It comes with two screws, this one and this one, which hold the two halves of the box together. These two screws here, which hold the up top and bottom or top and bottom of the receptacle into the box, and then these two white flathead screws here. These are not countersunk. 
This, on the other hand, is the countersunk screw that came out of the old receptacle that I replaced. That is the proper screw that goes in here. I think they just didn't have any, so they decided, you know what, paint these white, put them on there, and call it good. No. I mean, that works, but that's not appropriate. See? It already broke in the middle there. Well, the wiring's correct at least, so my grandfather would be proud. Okay, before we go any further, I want to deal with this stupidity. I mean, code may have changed and said otherwise, but... I mean, I'm assuming whoever did this knew what they were doing, and they, they understood that loading issues may cause problems. But I'm not seeing any things, and yes, the power's off. I'm not seeing anything here, like they're not burned, they're not pitted beyond when they were kind of in their little stat backstabby things. Like, I don't see thermal damage. It never got hot, and even though I know this room and the other room have been on space heaters at the same time, like, even the link doesn't look discolored or hot. Like, this was fine. I mean, it definitely didn't look pretty, but it was fine. And I just don't want to deal with that anymore, so we're just going to delete that. Also, yes, when I'm doing this, I'm trimming off the old copper, stripping off fresh copper, then putting the morettes on. There. Done. And it's got the proper countersunk screws in it. I know I was just slapping on Leviton there for not making great outlets. At least they know how to use proper screws. Now, when installing the new outlet, we need to keep in mind that my bed is going to be here. So we're going to go out 80 inches from that point which basically gets to a little bit before the mattress here. And then we're going to have the back side of a shelving unit, which is also going to have a TV. But I also want to then include another 12 inches, which is the maximum for a shelf, plus another 4 inches, because I then don't want to deal with having it right up against one of the legs of the shelving. So as a result, you end up with it like this. It's also slightly lower than the plate we just deleted because we can't have the Panduit going over the delete plate all the way down to there. That still leaves about 15 inches. It's 19 inches from here to the floor. That's fine. So let's say 15 inches here. That's fine for what we're doing. These hard shadows remind me and make me self-conscious of just how crazy my hair can be at times. Please, for the love of God, do not say Beetlejuice three times. Alright, now to pull the cable for this length. Okay, well, that's going to be the difficult part there. Done. It's not wired in, but uh, let's move on from there. Check that out. So there we go. Around the corner. To our last box there. And up to there. That is... Just enough raceway, I have no leftover, and just enough wire that not only do I have no leftovers, I still have four to six inches available at the ends so I can still do the wiring correctly. Now obviously everything up until this point has not been done in a single day. So that's given me a bit of a chance here to think about what that extra wire was that we found when I was doing the wiring in here. And I asked around, and someone had the brilliant idea, what if it's for a ceiling fan? I love, I, I mean, I guess, so you'd always have a constant supply of AC power that went up to the fan, and you just had like a pull chain so you could change the fan speed or turn it off, and then you had a second route of wires here, which was the light switch, which turned the light on and off on the fan. So, the only way to prove that is if I pull the fixture down and uh, see what's hiding in the box up there. And the answer to that one is a strongly worded no. In fact, there's not even a junction box up here. Now I know for a fact when I put all this foam up, there was not another junction box in this room. I'm pretty sure of it, I think. 
Might have photographs of this somewhere. I gotta go look. I see absolutely nothing that looks like wiring up there. Unless it's going sideways across there. Where the hell is that cable? Parental approval to put holes in the ceiling. All right, let's add a junction box. Well, that's a bit better. Too bad I gotta vacuum the damn floor again. Okay, that mess is temporary until I can get the floor cleaned up tonight and then I wanna redo that so I can get the final wiring done on that. But uh, there you go. That's going to be new. That's going to be permanent. That's nicely grounded and properly wired in now and properly protected in the ceiling. Doesn't answer where the last wire gut went, but we're still going to have to find that. Okay, it looks stupid. Believe me, it looks stupid. But we're going to go with this until I get the rest of my lighting sorted out. Actually, now I just remembered, I have to take that light off the ceiling anyways. I need something temporary, so I just quickly made this here. This is one of the reasons why I wanted to use twist lock plugs to attach all my lighting together, because I can be modular. Now, let me take my hand here and reach into the temporal wormhole that exists underneath my bed. And from Beaver Lumber, it is a Philips Softone 40 watt light bulb. Good thing I can still reach some incandescence from 1992. And there we go. Perfect. And there we go. Now we have my original fluorescent lighting's been removed, so now I gotta shuffle all of these tiles up here to close that gap off. And over here, I've started installing the first of the new fluorescent lighting. So this stuff is going to be quite special. Uh, Preheat fluorescent, like I mentioned. So that means there's supposed to be two starters up here, and thanks to um, weather delays, they haven't arrived yet. We have a 40 watt and a 20 watt ballast because we have one tube, which is a four foot, and then we have this one here, which is a two foot tube, which is about six feet total, or otherwise directly below me is my bed. So this is my new bed light. This here um, needs to be wired up next. I've done a couple of tests to make sure it's good. Nothing's powered up yet. It's just kind of tucked away until the wiring is ready. And then we'll move it over to there. So it's been several days since I was working on this, but I've run into logistical issues. Because it's so cold outside, followed by so much snow, items that I'm waiting for that I need to complete the wiring in the room have been delayed because they're still stuck in the mail. Well, in the meantime, I've decided to start taping out where the new shelves and walls are going to be. Let's start with this little U-channel here. That is the furthest point that the door is going to be. Now I've done the measurements and I've determined it would be nice to just go to there and have it go all the way around, but I've also concluded that's too narrow. I can't do that. From the door to here is four feet. Now I could try and do a shelf thing or something like that, but again I'm rethinking the whole ventilation thing here. I need to like, I need to rough this up a bit more because right now it just doesn't seem like it's going to work. But I ultimately do need something resembling a shelf or wall here. That's not going to be difficult. That's only like yay thick anyways. That's easy enough to do. And as you can see here, I've now taped out. This is going to be the other back wall of the shelving. And there's my desk right there. So I think I'm going to put the teletype machine here. You'll have the desk. And then more space here. And then my synthesizers are going to be stacked along back here. So maybe I guess I'll put the Atari ST in the corner. And that's causing problems. So that there, I can still leave the room, but technically it's immobile. And I'm still trying to find someone to take the TV um, this is really not going to work out in the final plan. I'm not sure what to do with that, so it's going to stay there for now. But, the new shelving, so that's two feet there. Surprisingly, the tele teletype machine is two feet. This is like three and a half, and then whatever's left over. My uh, planking for shelving is four feet max. I think I've mentioned that before. So that's totally fine. Um, so I'll make columns here. 
columns here, across, columns here, columns here. I have enough wood to do that. And then we can do our shelving, which is like one, two, and our third one, because we're gonna be going up six feet, both right over there and six feet over there. And then along the back wall here, there is a hell of a shadow because of a hell of a light right now. Um, we're going to have, it will not focus, there we go. Uh, we're gonna have more shelving, which is again, just kind of like, I don't know, a foot or a foot to a foot to a foot and a half between each set of shelves. And then I'll figure out what to do here. Probably I'll convert this here. Come on, focus. There, probably convert this here over to um, a table. Okay, let's prototype this out a bit. So you approach the door, and you can open it, and it goes to about there. So now you can walk, you have all the space here. You have all the space here. There's a laundry hamper, there's your light switch, there's an intercom, there's a meter. And this cardboard here defines the outside edge of a shelf which is not only dividing the bed from the door, but it's also giving me shelving that goes up six feet tall. So this gives me, this actually gives me a lot more space than I was thinking of. So that's actually okay. And then somehow, I have no idea how you complete that gap, but from there, it swings open another 90 degrees. And now you have the rest of the room. And there is the corner, and it's in line with the bed, so that would just be shelf. And again, you would have another six foot wall there. And I probably will keep this open, that way the teletype machine's just there. And if I do have things that are buried into the corner, like let's say the disk drive, like, I just moved the teletype machine out of the way, and now I have space to work around in. Plus, we have our shelving, which is only going to go out another, I don't know, a foot to a foot and a half. It's not even going to go the full extended length here, all the way across and then around. How is that going to look? Something like this. And I think the idea here is that it is eight feet out. So I have additional shelving pieces. I think for the bottom, I can get four by eight sheets of pre-painted pegboard, white. So that'll be, um, so the first two feet is going to be solid white painted particle board, just kind of for protection so you can't kick through the pegboard and damage it or anything like that. And then the top four feet of that is going to then be pegboard. So one, I can go straight through to the other side if I have to, because the shelving's right there, and also it provides a level of ventilation. Okay, so now I have to go get the pegboard so I can start assembling the back side to the shelving, which means, of course, again, I gotta wait for the snow to behave so I can load it onto the roof of a car. By the way, if you're curious, I have been metering myself the whole time. Since we started on this whole nonsense and you saw me wire it in about two and a half weeks ago, here's how much power I've consumed. I've only put about 50 cents in so far. And all we've been powering, if it's not the light on the ceiling, it's my alarm clock, or it's a vacuum cleaner, or it's a floor shampooer, or it's this work light. So that's not bad.
There, Gorm compatible shelf legs. So cutting these to be six foot tall each means that really it only adds an extra six inches over a Gorm shelf. But we flip this upside down so that the actual base of this will never use as a shelf is at the top. It is now whole compatible with Gorm. Now I have to do the cross braces as well for the sheets of plywood. And again, for a reminder here, the original Gorm shelves are about a foot deep. These new ones are going to be much larger by another six inches. And that's why I have all that particle board here, 18 inches across. Now, if I need smaller, and I will need smaller by the door, I just go with the 12 inches, and then I fence rip these, so they're just only 12 inches long as opposed to 18. I knew something stupid was going to come along eventually. So remember how I had the table kind of centered here as opposed to the far end and I wanted to put the teletype machine there? Okay, change of plans. Table goes to the far end, teletype machine goes there. Now I have a bunch of space, but also I use considerably less lumber. So I was thinking one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. But if I have it in this arrangement here, one, two, three, four, five, six, and then I have my shelving. So I actually have more than enough lumber for what I need. Uh, as you can see, I'm just kind of doing some sizing and spacing because surprise, surprise, this is not four feet. It's like about, what do I have? It's like 41 or 42, 43 inches, I believe, 44, somewhere in that range. I have to measure it out again. Hello there, tape measure, you are my friend. No, you are the tape measure, you are my friend. All right. And that means that from here to here, it's going to be a completely different size. This is 41 inches. This was like 44 inches. So I need at least two of these 44 inches. Two of these 41 should be straightforward and easy to do. And then so suddenly, bam, this all begins to come together. But not without its issues. You see, sure, at the very back here, we can mount the shelf like I was expecting to. We can't do that here because this isn't going out as far as the table. Doesn't matter over there because we have technically infinite space out to the wall, not here. So that'll just screw in like that and hopefully no one will notice it. Another thing that briefly spooked me for a moment is that on the original Gorm, sh Gorm shelving, um, the cross piece here has actually got a cut in it so that the boards going widthwise are actually countersunk and as a result this is all flush right here. I'm not doing that because I have no way to route all of that. I'm sitting a half inch on top of it. So I was like, hold on a minute. All of these holes here are drilled and spaced and sized so that your standard documentation and books, eight and a half inches, in this case here it's nine inches total, fit perfectly. If this is half an inch higher, None of these books are going to fit. Now hold on a second. Remember, the shelf above it's now going to be half an inch higher as well. So it will still fit. Okay, well that's a relief. And with a simple bit of trimming on the boards here, there we go. The first portion of the shelving is now already coming together. This is kind of why I wanted to continue with the Gorm styling because it does very rapidly come together once you have all the pieces. Even if it does remain somewhat rickety, that's going to be stabilizing itself once we have the backing put onto here. That makes it nice and square. And sure, I'm going to put an angle bracket there so this has no risk of falling over either that way or onto me while I'm sleeping. This, however, is just plain and simply going to suck to build for. This here, or the bed at least, is slightly more than four feet. In fact, it's, we're going to say 57 inches. And there's our 48 right there. Well, I'm not making a shelf that's going to have a divider right there so I have to find the middle and then again two four six so that'll make smaller shelves that are divided in the middle here I guess I can stagger them differently but it will supply or supply additional reinforcement for the TV that's gonna be mounted right here as well okay since we're waiting to burn time here let's finish off the wiring for the switch plate and the circuit here so here is the wiring for the brand new outlet here and over there that I've put in. Um, this here is the ceiling light. 
This here is the outlet over there behind the door that we already put an extension on as well. Um, we already know that these here are back from the meter. Don't worry about those. It's these two wires. I cannot, for the life of me, find where they go. They exit out of this box as a live circuit and disappear into the walls. We have double checked. It is not the light in this room. It isn't an extra circuit for this light in the room. It's for none of the outlets in this room prior to me working on it. It wasn't part of that ridiculous circuit there. It's unrelated to the outlets and lighting in the adjoining room, the hallway, the bathroom, another room there, anywhere on that far end of the house. It's not related to any of them. It isn't any of the outlets on the outside of the house or any circuits on the outside of the house. It's not even for a doorbell, and we don't have a ventilation fan in the attic, so it's not part of that circuit either. I am now positive this is a dead leg that goes somewhere into the walls and then just terminates, and I cannot find it. So rather than keep that live, I'm just going to cap this off and put it away, and we're not going to think about it again, because we know right now it's not live. So there's not some other circuit that's bridging across to this circuit breaker. And likewise, I currently have it is everything isolated, and I have my test leads here. My multimeter is on 20 mega ohms, so right now, even putting my fingers across this will give some sort of a resistance. If I take my fingers off, it goes up and it'll max itself out. There is nothing, nothing, no transformers, no resistors, no light bulbs, zero things are physically attached to this circuit. And it's not a mystery light switch anywhere. It's just dead. It's open. We'll leave it alone here. I'm going to consider it safe at that point. <sighs> that works. It was the bathroom fan. It was the bathroom fan. Upstairs. I'm not going to show the final wiring that's hiding in there because I'm sure that regardless of how I've done it, someone's going to finagle me and say you've done it wrong. Trust me, it's fine. Now, the other reason I wanted to stick with IKEA's GORM shelving design beyond just the pre-drilled hole in the cross members is that they've very carefully thought out exactly how the spacing and all this works. In your typical application, let's say we go one, two holes down, you can now fit standard size documents in there, like owner's manuals and the likes. And if you take that same shelf and you flip it upside down, now you can fit not only larger size documents, such as magazines, but also binders fit perfectly in the same spot. There we go, perfectly straight up and down. And even for the underside, when you have a flipped over like this, there's still some consideration that was brought out here. If not, this was unexpected. Again, one, two down. This time, flipped backwards, flipped the right way up. Just enough space for software titles to fit in there. So, perfectly space. Oh, I knew this was eventually going to happen. I screwed up. So, here are the boards that I have drilled using the hole spacing template. And then here's the piece of wood that's on the end that's going to have to go to the ceiling simply because of the weight of the TV preventing the shelf from falling over, even if I secure it over there. What do you notice is different? I didn't space the template correctly for whatever reason. As a result, all of these holes are several inches lower than they're supposed to be. All right, well, I was hoping to get perfect out of this, but I'm gonna have to put the template down again using one of my already cut pieces as a template and then redrill all the holes for this piece and the other piece that sticks out here. Hey, don't look at me. No one said that jig was gonna be perfect. Okay, so that's done now, and those are all done. But before we can finish this off, I have the kick panels to do. 
So those are done now. So there's the six inch piece at the bottom. And then there's the 18 inch shelf piece there. So that brings it up to two feet. And now the pegboard will do the last four feet all the way to the top of the shelving. And then, well, once this is done at least, I can then screw it together, push it up, and then we're good. Up on the ceiling, I'll have to move another tile, but I'll have a one foot wide spacer that goes up there, screws straight up. So this side here is also strong and rigid. And I have also done the cake paneling along here as well. Now, I have not screwed any of this in. This is just for show right now. Uh, now I have to take it all, uh, wipe it down because it's filthy, and then uh, give it all a coat of white paint. Since we've already concluded that I'm crazy, I have a large variety of smaller wattage fluorescent lamps that are handy just in case I need them. Well, this isn't fluorescent, it's incandescent, but I have now a selection of lighting I can use in my room. This here is going to be my new reading light over at my bed. And I'm probably going to choose either U or U for above my teletype machine. So these, of course, are going to be preheat fluorescent. I still have a circ light that's going to be in that side of the room, and that side I'm having difficulty with. This is a mess. Okay, so I do not have preheat fluorescent ballasts for circline tubes. Uh, this is a 22 watt circline. We like I know that for sure because it's brand new in the packaging. Uh, the problem is, I like I have electronic and um, rapid start non preheat ballast for this, but because I want to do it with preheat, I'm kind of limiting myself. Living in North America, again, um, I can get I can get preheat ballasts for circline used uh, because nobody's doing preheat um, ballasts anymore because fluorescence on the phase out but they're all 220 volt they won't behave here or at least I'm not going to be paying to ship a lump of iron uh, from somewhere across either the Atlantic or the Pacific to test this out but because I do have a fair number of these kind of cheesies 80s and 90s under the counter fluorescent lamps which are almost always going to be of either push button or preheat variety I can test with that um, so I can't use my fancy custom 30 and 45 or 35 to 45 watt uh, preheat ballasts for this. That'll work great on T8s and T12s that are four feet long. On something like this, um, which is 22 watts, like it's way too much current. You're either going to pop your filaments immediately or you're going to drastically wear out the tube. Uh, this here, like I said, I don't have 22 watts, but I have a bunch of these here, which are usually 15 watts. Um, sometimes they're slightly overrated, sometimes they are not. Uh, I'm going to play a dangerous game here, and I'm going to try and use a 15 watt ballast preheat with a 22 watt bulb. Now what that means is that the ballast itself is going to be very unhappy, unless it's been overbuilt and under spec uh, this is a General Electric and not an El Chinesium brand one, so we might get lucky here. But what I've done in the meantime is I've just kind of arranged up this giant mess of wires on a surface that I know is not going to catch on fire and nothing nearby is going to be flammable. And I have in here an FS2 1450 and 20 watt starter. And I should be able to just plug this in and it will light. Flicker warning. There we go. Okay, so I'm just going to kind of be in the other room and keep an eye on this for a little while. I want to see, like, I'm not going to be overdriving this lamp. I might be slightly underdriving it. I just want to see how hot the ballast gets. Actually, brilliant idea here. Uh, it's kilowatt time. So we know this is a 15 watt ballast, and well, at cold, it's currently 18 watts. Uh, the Rating for this is 0 0.33 amps of current draw. What are we at right now? 0.26. So we're actually underloading this. Well, let's let it warm up and see what happens. And we are back about 45 minutes later. So nothing has exploded. This isn't hot at all. This is actually just kind of lukewarm. The bulb is going to be... Yeah, the bulb's fine. And now we're still at 18 watts. And 0 
amps. So now this this ballast here it may not be ideal, but for this bulb it'll work fine. So here is the second fixture, just about 90% done, and as you can see, uh, I have trimmed off the outer ring here, which was a terrible idea, because the moment you take a pressed metal object that's somewhat thin and cut it like this, the moment you kink or wrinkle it, the whole thing just warps. So. It's now sitting on a wooden backer board. That's totally fine by me. I just screwed it down. And then spray paint's expensive right now. I don't know why. A can of generic black or gloss black is like $11. If I want Krylon, it's $15. But if I get this like metallic glossy automotive paint matching spray from our local surplus outlet, the craziest store in town, um, Sure, $2.99. I can get three cans for the price of one. So just did that down. It actually, in person, looks a little bit more matched to the ceiling. And we're not going to be mounting this directly to the ceiling because fire hazards. So instead, it's going to be hanging. So I have this box here where all of our wiring comes out to, and I have a cap for it. And the wiring will just snake out of there, but it's all protected and it's enclosed. And the high temperature stuff, the ballasts, are going to be on this side here with two rings of circlines. Really, at this point, all I'm missing is a starter socket here and a starter socket here, which, much like the other lighting, we're currently waiting for that to come in on the slow boat. Maybe I'm just going to have to buy more. Okay, after some hilarious mispainting, I do have the shelving set at the end of the bed, or the framing thereof, installed. And it is stabilized at the ceiling. I just need to put a screw in there and then I can put the foam back up there as well. And we are then ready to actually add shelves into here. And then finally we're able to take the pegboard and then mount it in. Because if you put the pegboard in first, you can't get you can get to the screws on this side. You can't get to the screws on this side. Wow, look at that. All the shelving is now installed on this side over here. Uh, oh, I still have to put in the uh, hanger hooks over there again. And look, the pegboard is there and the pegboard is there. And now the actual bedroom space here, you probably can't hear it, but surprise, surprise, I've made an error. It now echoes in here. <laughs> ha Okay, so I'm going to now work on that table there. And soon we can start working on this side over here, which is mostly going to be shelving. Gee, I sure wish my extra lighting arrived by now. This LED is amazingly harsh. Now that I have a lot of the framing completed on that side of the room, I can start working on the electrical. So here's the outlet that was on the far side near the window. I've added these two right angle Hubble outlets, which now go to one power bar located on the other side for my alarm clock and my bedside light, and this other cable here, which runs across over to the APC uninterruptible power supply, which runs my Silicon Graphics O2. Meanwhile, over by the door, a power bar has been mounted underneath the bed to supply power to the media PC. The cable runs up and is terminated right here at this outlet. There is an MOV based surge suppressor add-on that's been plugged into it and that's just simply because the power strip that I have installed under there doesn't have any of that magic. It has a circuit breaker and a physical on off switch and nothing else. Alright, it's been three weeks and none of the parts I have ordered have arrived. They're somewhere in the mail. They're close. I feel like the easiest way to get them is maybe to tease them out and to buy another $20 in sockets and holders. Alright. And shelving. There we go. Two rows of shelves. 12 inches deep and down below a 14 and an 18 inch shelf for the keyboards. I'd like to have them tilted, but I'm using all of these wall brackets here because I had a whole bunch left over. Now I have to do at least one more table for the ST, which is going to go right here. And then I think I'm going to mount the monitor for, uh, swing arm on the wall. And I think we're almost done. I may also just fix that because, you know, it's going up instead of sideways. Just need a knob for that now. 
Well, there is our sweet CRT mount that's been attached to the wall. And while I was doing it, I remembered, oh, right, I can't mount to that corner side of the corner. Sorry, that side of the corner. Because we had the whole, that whole extra drilled for the water meter. So I had to move it over to the other side and I just took the uh, table mount bracket and that's just kind of an insurance because the last thing I need is this monitor falling down, breaking the monitor and damaging the synthesizers. But it's got this little tiny swivel thing and it has a handle on it. It's supposed to have a gas strut so you can raise or lower it. That is long since dead. But that doesn't matter. In this case here, I can just kind of adjust it where I want it to. Have it in front of the keyboard, have it in front of the ST, and the cable itself is long enough for me to do this. And I'll figure out later if I need a color or a monochrome monitor for this, because I'm pretty sure Notator wants mono. And after some substantial woodwork and some running out of more screws, uh, there we go. Shelving is finally done for this corner here, and as you can see, I've done a bit of a dry run to see how everything fits. The monitor goes there, the ST goes there, the keyboards go there, and even hiding underneath here is our megafile drive. So that's all good. Now, of course, I need to go and obviously screw everything down. And what I'm going to do is that, for these tables at least, I'm going to put one or two uh, cable holes through there instead of snaking them around and around. Especially for the drive, the DMA cable is only a foot long. So it'll go through and underneath and around. Then we'll do power bars, and then I can start wiring stuff up in here. And guess what? I mean, aside from the stupid damn lighting, which I still am waiting for starters on, uh, we're ready to start loading things back into the room again, finally. Actually, now that I think about that, that's a flat lie. You see that crossbar there? I still have one kind of corner shelf table to put into the corner there to deal with this giant open hole. And the same also applies over here. I still don't actually have a bedside table. So I only have one remaining 48 by 18 inch sheet of half inch MDF particle board. So this is gonna have to go a long way. There we go, and with a little tiny bit of woodwork there, I have built myself a little shelf, which makes myself a bedside table. And hiding underneath there, barely visible, is a switchless power bar. So there's always power available to outlets hiding behind here. Might also put a network jack back here, I'm not entirely sure. But as for why no drawers or shelves, or why not just, you know, use a proper bedside table, server furniture. That's why. So the networking, the cable, the telephone, and all that jazz is coming in from the corner of the room that the meter is in through this raceway. The original idea was to run along here and then just kind of tuck it away underneath the foam as it got over to there and then back down the wall over to over there. But it was getting kind of cumbersome. These pieces here that's five feet long. That's $25. So to do this would have cost me at least an extra $50 just to do this corner of the room. It was dumb. The other problem I was running into was that once I got down to here, over in that corner, I was then up against our metal raceway here. And I had to still drop a length down here anyways to service the TV. And then I realized that's an awful lot of work for me to have to put things in front of this wall. I can totally put it on the back side of the wall and because of the bookshelf I can just hide it back there and it doesn't need to be in the raceway. So instead, what I'm going to do is that, well, this wasn't going to fit anyways as you can see, it's just oh so slightly doesn't work. But if I take that out of there, I've widened that hole just enough that this fit snugly in there and it has space and so what I'll do is that since I already have this raceway down here is that I'll run it along run it along and then same thing over here it just disappears behind the bedside table and any weird wire terminations can be done there at the same time it tees off up there to go behind all of this so it can then service the TV 
and go down below to the Media Center PC that's living under the bed. So, let's do that tonight. I understand this stuff is adhesive backed, but I use this stuff at work on a regular basis. And even though it's adhesive backed, and it will take the paint and even the backing of the drywall when you take it off, it doesn't last. So you might as well just put screws in as well. None of these are not like the other. It's like ordering fries and getting one onion ring inside of that order. You know, it does really suck that I ended up having to put this almost exactly at the line for my mattress. But at the end of the day, it actually looks really good. And I can still unsnap and open this and feed my wires through almost whenever I want. And all I have to do is just nudge the bed over a little bit and push it over there and we're all good. Come on. Yes. Success. Come on. Uh, wires. It is way past my bedtime on a Sunday night. Because yes, I have to be awake at 6 a.m. tomorrow on Monday. And yet, here I am finishing off with the cabling because I can't really sleep on my bed because I currently have it pulled away so I can work. So I have finished pulling all of the cable. I have finished installing all of the raceway. I'm now just snapping it shut. So what we have here is ethernet for the side of my bed. Should I need ethernet for whatever reason? I have ethernet for the silicon graphics O2. I have two pair station wire. So this will be my telephone, which I can actually turn off at the PBX during certain hours, and the fax machine. I have another two pair for the teletypes modem, so it's a dedicated line, as well as the dial-up modem that's attached to the Silicon Graphics O2, so there's another dedicated line. And lastly, because I was pulling all of this, I might as well pull another set here for ISDN. Over here at the Panasonic KX-TD816 is this little buddy, which showed up just before the new year. It is a two basic rate access, that is two ports of BRI S0 ISDN. That I can tell, and that I've read the documentation, this isn't designed to go from the telephone company to this box. It is designed to give ISDN within the building doesn't care about what's on the other side. I'm not sure how it works, but I might as well wire it in because I have unused pairs on the trunk wire, which goes over to the 66 block and just kind of buried there. You see that there? Those are the two new lines I added. I still have to bring over across the house um, the ISDN line. Thankfully, on this side of the house here, oh look, it's that terrible foam. You remember what I said about that. Um, this is all unfinished, so it's actually not that difficult. I just have to follow along here, and then just pull the wire along that raceway back over to the 66 block. Well, the second order of starter sockets have finally arrived. Just thin little bits of plastic with little tiny contacts. All right, let's get some proper lighting put into the room now. You know, it's two interesting things when I went to the Home Depot because I had to go get myself uh, another tube. So it seems that, sure, General Electric has stopped doing fluorescent tubes, but I guess Philips has as well. Feet, fight, Fayette? I, I really don't know. Um, that's a brand I've never heard of before, but I guess someone's taking up the slack at the Home Depot and, well, if you're really desperate for fluorescent tubes, they still have T12s. They're not cheap, but the other options now are pretty much LED. What also amuses the absolute hell out of me is the fact that the Home Depot still sells starters. 
Now, these ones here, these FS2s, I can understand these, because I still see things even into the 2000s that were using these, like aquarium lights, desk lamps, uh, vending machines, stuff like that, small things. Even stove lamps or stove range lamps had uh, starters in them. But this, on the other hand, these confuse me. So these are FS4s, so they are rated for much larger 35 and 40 watt lamps. Four foot tubes, T12 and T8. Um, in European countries and 220 volt countries, like these are still a thing. But in North America, going back, oh hell, what, 70 years? Um, we quite rapidly switched away from these to um, rapid start and instant start fluorescent ballasts that don't require starters. I would assume that decades later, nobody has four foot um, preheat fixtures left. And yet, for $5, you can buy a pack of two FS4 starters. Janktacular, but um, I have a level of faith in this thing not burning the house down, surprisingly. So, this cord here doesn't go into the sun, but it goes into this twist lock here. The ground is also our strain relief, and it goes up and actually goes into the ground. And then I've gone and tinned the line in neutral so I can push them into there, and then that distributes power around. So, all right, let me put a bulb in and let's put the starters in. The amount of effort required just to do this is substantial, but I'm happy with the results. So the circ lines are going to be smack in the middle of these tiles here. And what I've actually done, you can kind of see, is I've drawn an arc. And at three points around, I've made these brackets, which are going to hold adjustable uh, wire supports so that I can hang this from the ceiling. So I can then hang down like, like six inches, eight inches or something like that. And uh, it should hopefully look really cool. The other reason why I'm actually using where I'm keeping the foam up there is that originally the plan was to just stick it up there. My parents had said use this double sided adhesive tape. Um, this resulted in a solid night of sheer terror as it's pitch black and you're feeling stuff falling on you and you're hearing nothing else. So... Um, yeah, if I try and peel it off, it's just going to take the ceiling with it, so that stays up there. This is either going to look really cool or really stupid. It looks like a UFO, but you know what? This is actually coming out really nice. Oh yes. Yes, I am in love with this lamp. Excellent. Eh, okay, might need to change that inner bulb there with something that's more color matched, but that looks excellent. And like clockwork, not 24 hours later, the rest of my order arrived. So there's sockets, and there's uh, bulb holders. You know, it's interesting. So I watched the tracking from the last shipment that I had. Um, different sellers, left different locations, cleared customs here, reached last leg, then disappeared. Thankfully I'm not out a whole hell of a lot of money. This stuff, however, again, different sellers, and here it is. Actually, no, I lied, sorry. This is actually from the same seller I bought from before. So that leads me to believe the seller's genuine, and I knew it, someone's stealing my mail. So somehow I've managed to run out already of uh, Leviton FS4 starters, but thankfully for $2.50, I got another two starters that I could work with, and those are installed now. This is a big light. 
Oh, but I am quite proud of it. Now it's not painted, so there's a bit more cleaning here to do, but I am going to see how this looks when it's lit. And it is indeed absolutely marvelous. This is probably also one of the less flickery ones that I have as well, which is gonna be great, so it's gonna help me above the wardrobe. All right, so now it's time to dewire the ballast and the wiring and uh, paint this the same as we did with the circline frame and get it ready to be hung. Well, the light is now assembled and it's already on its hangers. Now I just need to adjust them. But I wanna take a moment here to say that I'm not being chaotic in how I'm designing these lights. Everything is having a reason to be what it is. This one here looks mirror identical on both sides and was very carefully measured and cut because there's only two wires currently supporting it. And if we look at the level on top, come on, it is perfectly leveled. I've put a lot of thought into this. So even though it looks chaotic, I'm trying to at least show that I know what I'm doing. And there we go. I am very happy about this one. It's actually quite bright in here now. And I mean, okay, as an added consequence here, I am now consuming something to the range of 180 to 190 watts. But previously I would have done something like this with 360 watt bulbs. And well, it's close enough, but now I have, well, I don't like how much power I'm consuming. You just unplug it from the junction up there. All right, well, that does it for lighting. So let's finish off on the shelf work. And there we have a shelf. So what I have done here is that I had scrap pieces of that. So I used one as a gap filler here and is also a kind of a plate here. So when the teletype's in here, there's not a giant huge opening that's sitting right there. You can sit stuff underneath there now and it's not glaringly like, it's just sitting there. And also at the same time, it's reinforcement because it's open at the back. We put that cross piece right here a long time ago, probably earlier in the video here. So that supports it there. And right here, I have a single bracket which is holding it to here. So this is a very sturdy piece of wood. So taking apart the fax machine so I can change the belt is now my opportunity to figure out how exactly I'm supposed to hang this thing on the wall. So ultimately what I've concluded is that, you see those two holes there? I've put those there and here is the bracket that I'm gonna use on the top to hang it. Now, unfortunately, it's not reinforced there. So, just these two screws aren't going to be enough. Eventually it's either gonna sag or it's gonna break the plastics here. So I have to figure out reinforcement on the bottom or the front. Also, when I have this open, I'm keeping an eye out for where can I find a spot where I can put fasteners on the inside that won't cause any serious issues. Uh, the closest place I could get here is this giant metal strip is a heat sink, but it's grounded. So this here, it doesn't matter if I have fasteners touch that. Um, that's not going to cause any damage. You can see I did nick the board here, but these traces are far enough away that's not going to cause any trouble. And ultimately, what I've determined is that there is a little bit of space between this gear, this microphone here, and just up in here. So again, I have gone and drilled a very tiny, where the heck is that hole? There it is, that very tiny little hole there. And a bracket on the underside is just gonna kind of support it and keep it secured from to the wall from the bottom. So, uh, oh, and don't worry about that broken stem. That was like that apparently when I took it apart and it doesn't wanna glue back together. So we're another reason why I don't wanna necessarily trust the top of this to hold all the weight of a fax machine. And there we have it. Finally, for the first time since Back to the Future Part 2, have I seen a fax machine mounted to a wall solidly. Stupidest thing in the world, but that took years and I'm satisfied. Okay, so I can't put my phone 
next to it, so I might put it on top. Now I have a black phone, so I can match it up if I want to. Now if I'm not satisfied with having the phone on top, maybe I can put like a message board or something and leave the phone on the table. But now at this point here, I can finish uh, terminating all of my phone and network connections, and I can start uh, beginning the cleanup phase. So those new telephone lines that we pulled come across the house to here. Unfortunately, a number of years ago, we had actual copper out to the telephone exchange get removed. In its place now, the fiber modem also serves double duty as a VoIP system as well. So we just kind of, well, left the phone box originally as it is there, and now it routes into the 66 block. All of these colored cables here run off to my Panasonic's KX-TD816PVX. These lines here go off to the various phone jacks in the house. These ones here, these two right here, are original to the house. Those are three wire. Every other one here that's white is now two pair. So that means I can now run really your choice of options here. So if I want to do a single line to an outlet, that's not a problem. If I want to do two pair digital proprietary to any of the Panasonic systems, I can do that. And of course, because it's the 816, it will let me do analog lines. So I can address every single jack in the house as one phone line. But now I have to punch in our new lines. I guess my blade's starting to get a bit weak. There we go. Sixty-six block is technically obsolete at this point. It is not rated for high-speed data or networking, but for telephone purposes, it's still perfectly usable and the tools are cheap. Wants a double punch. Easy. Now, temporarily, I need to make sure that my new lines are good, so I'm just going to quickly patch in here. A new line. You know what I can do here? I can take our tool flip it around and now I can punch without cutting I'll need to cut that one on the end. Let me get my green wire here ready to go. Just enough for me to terminate that one. Again, flip our tool around. The shadows are terrible. And then I have my blade. A 
And then I'll jump her back in. Red ring. Green tip. And then I'll use my test set here to make sure I'm actually hearing something. Still good up here? Yes, I'm still good up here. Okay, we're punched in. So I just remembered that the reason that we have these loops here to begin with is that currently the PBX is bypassed. All the lines, nothing is wired in right now. It's been in a dry run test since 2021 and I forgot that I was dry run testing it. So I've only had one line actually hooked up to it. So I'm gonna have to rearrange this and start adding stuff into the PBX and also figure out which of these three lines here are the ones, two of them I just added, one of them is going to be ISDN, one has to be shared with an existing line on the punch block. Thankfully, when you have a punch block like this, you're going to have yourself a list of exactly how everything is wired in. So I am going to spend a little bit of time here uh, figuring out what went where, updating this list, and uh, repunch. To help me with the tracing process, I have this little thing. Now, this isn't the original box for it, obviously, but the idea here is that uh, you attach it to your phone jack, either via these very nice um, sharp alligator clips or just using the modular jack. And when you turn it on, on your test set, or really any phone, you should hear a tone. So I can leave that on and I can go to the other end of the line now that I've disconnected everything else and figure out what is where and then reorganize it. So this here is going to have two pairs going to it. This is going to be my phone. So it is sharing with this one here. We're not going to actually delete this from the room. We're going to leave this in here, but we're going to reuse. We're going to double the run. So now it comes over to here. So I have the analog line but I also have the digital line. So I technically have two phones that are accessible from this one jack. So it's this wire right here. Okay, so I'm gonna disconnect it from here and move it and re-terminate it up on this line up here. Okay, I got those two sorted right there. So those are now shared on the same line. Now let me cut away a bit for, uh, for a bit here and I'll figure out these last two lines. One of these aren't even going to be telephone. One of them are going to be ISDN. This is going to get me going. So this one here is our ISDN line. It's currently not wired to anything because I don't have an outlet for it in my room yet. Uh, this one here is our modem and our fax, hence why red-green is one pair and yellow and black is another analog pair and everything's bridged together so when the main phone rings everything's gonna ring and it's still on full bypass for the PBX. Okay and those two lines are now wired in as well. Here's our um, one of our Ethernet lines and there's our ISDN line so I'm gonna have to wait until I can find myself another dual RJ45 outlet and then I can put that in there. Um, it actually kind of sucks that the, uh, the teletype and the SGIO2 are going to sh share the same modem line. Um, for the most part, it's unlikely that both will need to see activity at the exact same time, but it means that I can't use the teletype now to directly call the O2 and then just have like a very slow console from the silicon graphics machine. That kind of sucks. Oh well. Um, and I can't run one more line because, sure, um, one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven, I only have um, one more analog line left in the TD-816, hence the eight part in there. So that's been reserved. I have actually buried a telephone cable out to the corner of the yard in preparation for a payphone. So now I just need a single freestanding payphone booth and, I don't know, a fairly generic smartless payphone and uh, that'll be good to go. But that is not part of this video and I'm not gonna wait around for another outlet to show up for this. So I'm gonna consider this done. 
Uh, I think that does it for almost all the wiring. I think it's just the TV mount, and we're ready to start cleaning. Wait, what the hell am I talking about? Right there, A1, my bedroom. Ring and tip, there's an analog line there I completely forgot about. So my proprietary phone runs on the digital line, and I guess I could run the teletype on A1. Whatever. Okay, anyways, you get the idea. Now that we're at a point here where my sleeping space is a, just a giant white space covered in pegboard, now is a fantastic time to be putting up posters or decorations or something like that. But let me tell you something, when you're like me and you're in your 30-somethings and you live in your parents' basement, there is no motivation. There's just despair. So that's why I'm mounting a TV at the foot of my bed. Of course, it's going to be a 42-inch plasma. There's the media PC that's going to manage it all. Now how the heck are we going to keep a plasma there at the foot of my bed without it in the middle of the night falling off and crushing me in the most Darwinism way possible? I'm not sure. Remember though, we have a solid uh, board that goes all the way down. We're mounted at the ceiling there and we're mounted at the wall on this side here. I've put brackets in so it's all steady. Uh, this is gonna be weird. So I can put one bolt here. I obviously can't put one there because there's a level that sits there. I wish they could have taken that out or something. And then these bolts here, so it's smaller washers on this side, and then on this side, much bigger washers. So, I mean, there's always the risk that it will pull out but mm, I'm going to try my damn hardest to make sure it doesn't fall out. And at the end of the day, if the plasma ever dies on me, I can keep the mount there and continue using a modern LCD. That is absolutely perfect. And all the wiring happens behind that wall there, so it all snakes around behind the shelf. So... This plasma is not ready for prime time. I have to take it off the wall again and recap it because, sure, it's a capacitor issue. We hope with this thing. But that ends all the fabrication work, I believe. So it's finally time. What I'm going to do here is that everything, like anything fabric or any kind of surfaces that can, like, collect dust, we're going to take those out, and then we are going to dust or blow the room out. Then we're going to vacuum it, and then it should be ready, finally, for things to start going back in. Now, because the 816 is so forgiving in, for, in terms of what you're plugging into your extensions, uh, extension 1 can only allow for one digital proprietary type phone. But technically, an unlimited number of analog phones can use an extension. You can just really only use one analog device at a time. So, this here is where the two pairs terminate for the digital phone. I can still use the analog port on the back of that phone if I so desire. But it also exits out the second, or the first pair in here, exits out and goes up and goes to another box that's hiding back here. And that's how the fax machine's gonna be plugged in because it's entirely unlikely that I'm going to need to receive a fax at the same time I need to use the analog line for whatever reason. I'm doing my final sort here as I begin to file my tools back away where they're all supposed to be. And as I was going through the trash, I remembered, oh yeah, the very beginning of the video, remember when I was talking about these things? They came prepackaged with all the new uh, electrical raceway. And I didn't trust these at all because they were plastic welded together and I don't even know who manufactures them. So I switched them out with more expensive, heavy-duty outlets. Well, I was also mentioning that I was having issues with these plastic welded ones where they were just kind of falling apart on me. And as it turns out, at work, another one of those actually failed on me. That's Leviton. Definitely Leviton. Just falls right off. If that there, if that screw is missing, or if this mounts in some other way, this falls off. And now you have a fun case on your hands. And I do believe this will actually fall apart even further, though, yeah, if those there get even more damaged or kicked, like this thing just falls apart on you. I don't trust these. This is why I go for ones that are nicely riveted together. Quality. So as I start to unpack all of my boxes and bring things back into the room, I have to deal with a couple of storage problems. 
and it did involve more investment into boxes. So the first thing about the bed is that yes, I basically sleep on a futon mattress, which is often like sleeping on a piece of plywood. It's flat, it can be lumpy, probably isn't good for my back, but whatever, I'll deal with that in 20 years. In the meantime, this IKEA bed frame has these slats that I can fold away. Now that means that for doubt here, sure, I do have trays that I can put things in, but further back in, I've purchased these relatively cheap bins. They're just tall enough that they fit underneath here, so you can fill them full of things, and if you need to get access to them, you just basically fold the mattress back and get in there, and um, they're all closed up, so at the same time they won't fill up with dust or have risk of rodents getting in there or whatever happens, they're sealed. And I have stuff that's buried in the far back corner here, which I have no reason to get into at any time for years. But this stuff's still easy to get to, I just fold it back. There we go. Now, for this shelving here, I have purchased all of these blue bins. These are actually recycling bins, so I guess that if I ever leave and abandon this stuff, well, you know exactly what stuff to throw away. But they're the perfect size for these shelves. Well, almost perfect size. These are nine inches, this is 14 inches, and as you can see, there's a giant gap, so I may change these, or you can put extra tall items into these bins. And then all my gotchis and socks and stuff like that can get to have these drawers here. And lots and lots of spare socks. And for the rest of it, well, currently it's becoming kind of box hell, because I'm beginning to realize, oh, some things no longer fit. Hmm, the 7925. All right, I gotta make a call on this video here. By the time you watch this, it may have already sold. Uh, I've been trying to find the boards to adapt this to my HP 45 for almost 10 years now. And I've been completely unsuccessful finding those boards. So, it's taking up space, it's gotta go. The projector, I, at the same time, uh, looking for a new home already. So, we'll work on that. So here's my somewhat easy fix for what is otherwise an engineering flaw. Um, really, what I should be using for this here is solid half-inch plywood. Um, this here is not strong enough. It's chipboard. It's particle board. So even as you put the, uh, the weight load of books or an Apple Lisa on top of it, of course it's going to sag. So as insurance, I've just gone back with these wooden strips here. There's them there. There's more up above. And they're screwed in. And that there will help with the flexing. It'll never stop it. I mean, it's weight, but for now, that's going to work. I am both proud of it and saddened by it. I hope one day something replaces the Living Computer Museum. Oh, look what finally decided to show up. Well, a couple weeks ago, I had my second order of those missing bulb sockets show up, but I still never saw the original starter sockets that I had been waiting for since the very beginning of all this, and it was dragging me down and delaying me. Well, this little box showed up, and there are the starter sockets I was missing. Incredible. So I wasn't actually taken for a ride for a couple of dollars. They were just super slow on the boat. Well, I don't need those anymore, but I'll keep them around as spares. This is really more scope creep than anything, but honestly, I, since I've been trying to get my bedroom done, the phone system's been waiting until I could get all the wiring done. And as you can see, I have now gone, without recording it, and punched all the wiring. Everything's now terminated, and now I'm just configuring everything, and that's it. We're done. Now, actual configuration of the PBX, as you might expect from a system of the 90s, is very primitive. This here is the official programming utility that comes from Panasonic. It actually runs under MS-DOS, but it'll run under Windows XP, no problem at all. And it just operates over a uh, serial port. So we are going to add now the extra three phone lines that we had before. So I'll select Station, and I will go to Station Settings. And that will then load up the list of extensions that are already programmed in the machine. There we go. So I can change my extension numbers at any time, so they're all set at their default. So my bedroom is 101, and that's a digital line. But we have XDP, which is 
the extended port so I can have the activate the analog port and have it independent from the digital line. So I'll make that yes. And I'll make that. And that's now set. And following off of a cheat sheet that I have made, which is my routing and also my labeling, I can say here that uh, line six on analog is the teletype. And I can go and enable XDP on that, which turns on the analog jack. I don't need the digital line to be used anymore. And the same goes down for line seven, which is the modem that's attached to the Silicon Graphics 02. And so now I can dial into that modem from anywhere in the house or outside the house and just specify the line on extension 207. So I'll turn that on and then I would hit F7. And from that point on there, there we go, save completed. So the system has now been configured and the phone system is now active and running. And yes, if you don't like a text base like console system for configuring it, that's not a problem at all. There is a program out there called Programmator for the Panasonic KXTD 1232 and the 816, um, which is all fancy and graphical. But two things, one, it's not an official Panasonic program, and two, that costs money. So this text-based version here, while it may seem inferior, is free. So I have no problem using this instead. Well, everything's finally starting to thin out here, and I can actually begin to start setting up my camera. It's just a couple more cardboard boxes to break down and recycle, and that's about it. Well, we remember what we saw at the beginning of the video here and what the room was like as we walked through here and walked down the hallway. I am happy to say, finally, we are done. Now be careful, there is surrealism beyond this door. And I will hit the switch. And there we go, let there be light. So here is all of our shelving and we still have open space for even more bins. Going around that there, we have our sleeping area now. So nice bed here, don't have to worry about stuff piled up against the wall there. Nice spacious bedside table. Oh look, and a server table. What great use of furniture and good taste in reading books as well. And if I don't want to get out of bed, that's totally fine by me because I have myself right up here a nice 42 inch stereo plasma display, not a TV. So this is very fancy. This is very fun. And how am I driving that all? Through a shuttle XPC that lives down here running Windows XP Media Center. Will I get tired of it? Absolutely. And that's why you don't see here there's going to be a basket and an extra PlayStation 2 over components so I can play games here while I'm in bed. It's absolutely fantastic. And of course, fold this back and I have storage space hiding behind all of this here, which is easy to reach at any time I need. Now, sure, there are still some boxes and a couple things here which need to leave the room, but this stuff here at the time of this video was for sale. If you're watching this video many years later, Chances are this is already gone. I can finally hang up my beautiful x-ray tube. That's a genuine antique right there. And I have yet even more available bin space up there. Yes, this here is actually empty. It just kind of has a flag in it right now. And I have clear storage so I can see some of my supplies. I have a wardrobe which contains all of my clothing. And then finally, I now have a workspace with shelving. I can actually reach all of my books and still have storage on top for my other very large items like high-speed cameras, wire recorders, and my prized Apple Lisa. Now, sitting down here at the desk is the same thing we had before, my Silicon Graphics O2 workstation. I have attached to it there this Wacom tablet and this mini disc recorder and player, and I can listen to that all I want. I have a disc array, magneto optical, and oh hey, there's even a modem attached to this. So because with the new PBX phone system, I have fax that's dedicated in this room over a VoIP line. I have a regular telephone in this room over whatever line I wish, even cellular if I wish. And down here I have a dedicated modem line. So any phone line in the house can dial into this O2 
which means I can then communicate with this SGI using terminals. And speaking of terminals, we now have in here my Model 33. Let me turn on this light here. Of course it's fluorescent. Why would it be anything otherwise? This here has been converted a bit. It's a Model 33 with a built-in Hayes Smart Modem. One day I will make a YouTube video out of this. In the meantime, Curious Mark does have a video series on getting his back and working again. And I still have access to all my other books here, as well as a small collection of video cameras. I'm sure Cathode Ray Dude would be jealous of a few of these. And of course I can put my trophies and pins up here as well. And then other trophies, which I haven't been able to set up at all in the last 10 years, my synthesizers, the Emacs 1000, the Yamaha DX7, we have a Notator Unitor 2 right there, and other various odds and ends. More trophies, and this fancy little floppy disk that thank you to everyone at VCF Midwest 2023 for signing. If I missed you, don't worry, I'm going to try and come around again and do this. And other great odds and ends. You know, it's funny. I have one of these NCIX signs as well. Linus has one as well. He seems to enjoy his because, well, that one was from me as well. I had two of them. And yet even more books, more cool things, oh look, an x-ray tube. And more odds and ends that need to leave this room. So same thing as before. This stuff here, even though it's large, I have designed the room so you can still roll this out there and out of the house completely. That concludes the work on this place. I really hope you enjoyed this very long and lengthy series on renovating my bedroom. There was well over 130 clips that now I have to go and edit and assemble. We started at January 1st, 2024. It is currently March 2nd, 2024. So just about two months to get this completed. Thank you for watching, and until next time, have a good one.